And good evening. Welcome to Faith and Victory Church, our hour of power. Tonight's going to be 40 minutes of power. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. We're so glad to have you with us tonight. And as we continue our series and looking like we're going to complete our series on your words, your tongue, and your future. Uh, just to recap just a little bit, you know, we talked about the beginning of this a few weeks ago, that words are the seeds that start the process of life. Uh, two things we have to understand to be a man or woman of faith and power is that nobody has a choice of whether or not you live by words. You have what words you live by. Um, that, and, and we talked about how to apply our faith, to say it, do it, receive it, and tell it. Talked about how Jesus is the high priest of our confession. Um, <clears throat> we talked about how our words can change things, particularly our body, our circumstances, our lifestyle. And... Um, <clears throat> then we start talking along those lines of speaking uh, our scriptures on speaking or confession and our, our conversation or lifestyle, uh, putting the words, living by love, making sure we, li we, uh, we choose to live by faith and not by sight. Um, our actions can make or break our confessions. And, uh, you know, faith without act, dead, being alone. We also needed, we talked about how we have to understand that God is for us and that God keeps his word amen god does what he said he would do and then we got began talking about the godly tongue um and that was where we we're gonna we started just a little bit last week and then we got off into uh um the good man out of the good treasure brings forth good things so um but just a couple of verses here uh psalm 13 2 2 and 3 again i mean i'm sorry psalm 13 2 and 3 a man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth but the soul of the transgressor shall eat violence he that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. And, um, and then we moved from there, and we began talking about the, the front mouth and perverse lips. And then we got the one where we kind of went off and stayed over there the rest of the time last week was set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, keep the door of my lips. And we began talking about how important it was to guard the things we say. But in order to guard the things we say, we must ultimately guard the things we put in us. What, what we feed on, what we allow into us <clears throat> must be guarded. Because out of the, uh, you know, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so that's kind of where we, we kind of just got, I don't say hung, but that's where we ended up landing last week and staying with. Um, talking about the treasure of our heart and how important it is what we put in so that we can get the right things out. You, and we and remember we got off into the whole computer thing. Garbage in, garbage out. The central processor unit of the computer is the, the central processor of the believer is his heart. Uh, your tongue is the input. And, you know, you can't put bad in and get good out. You know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about that. <clears throat> and some people got some real revelation out of seeing a computer model drawn. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, Penny was just so excited because it just made sense to her how a how it related, you know, and, uh, you know, the printer was the output and our consequences, our results were our output, okay? <clears throat> and so we started, we were talking about that, 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 that deposit in our heart. Matthew 12, 20, 36 says, I say unto you that every idle word um, shall men, that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. So Jesus is not, you know, we, we get kind of flippant about, um, our words, we get flippant about, oh, that's not important. You know, it doesn't matter that much. God is going to do what he's going to do. If that low, you wouldn't be given an account of every word you speak. There's a lot of things we say that people say that don't uh, line up with Scripture. Grandma told them, Uncle Henry told them, or they've always believed it that way. Oh, well, so what? Whether you're not, if you believe the whole world was flat all your life, I mean, we, we, do you know that we now have a uh, flat earth movement? It's not millennials. <laughs> Just say, it's not millennials. <laughs> Just want you to know, it's not, we're not that cray-cray. We were bad, but not, not that cray-cray. Yeah, we've got flat earth movement going on again. The, the, the earth is flat, and all the pictures from our space are lies. They're, they're fake. They, you know, there are people who believe that we didn't land on the moon. That it, was, uh, it was in a um, warehouse in, in Houston. And they had set the whole thing up in there, and uh, it really didn't happen. It was all propaganda. And, um, you know, and, and we, don't have the we didn't have the technology then to do that, you know, to fake g zero gravity or low gravity and all that kind of stuff. We, we just didn't have it. We didn't have the CGI stuff. And even CGI, if you look hard enough, you can tell it's CGI. 
you know. Um, so anyway, um, so we have to give an account of our works. Then let's start, go to Romans chapter 10. Very famous chapter to, in, to us, a very important chapter. And Paul writing here, he gets um, some. <coughs> writes in verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Now he's saying if, you're gonna, if you do the law, and, and, and listen, we have to remember, People come along and say, you know, they'll say, they'll say, they'll say stupid stuff. Everybody's just, just stupid stuff. If, if we, if we do anything the Old Testament teaches, then we're doing the law. And we're, you know, that's not what he's saying here. If you're trying to achieve righteousness by doing ceremonial washing, washings, you know, <clears throat> then you have to do the entire law because that was the only under the law. The only way to become righteous was to complete, completely keep the entire thing. That's not what you know. So that's not saying. Um, that you know, not committing adultery because it's under the law is okay now, because I don't have to do that because that's law. If I try to do that, I'm, I have to do everything. No, I'm in Christ. I'm under grace. Uh, go to the mirror, and slap yourself. Maybe you'll snap out of it. All right. The man which doeth then shall live by those things. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise: Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the dead? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what saith it? The word is now there or near to you, even in your mouth, or in thy mouth, and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. And here it is, that if thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus, or Jesus is Lord, as alternate translations say, and shalt believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. With the heart, uh, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation so and then he goes on and says for the scripture saith whosoever shall believe on him shall not be ashamed for there is no difference between the jew and the greek for the same lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him for whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved <clears throat> and so he come here and paul makes the the great declaration and how anybody can miss this. Salvation is not achieved through penance. Salvation is not achieved through some ritualistic uh, exercise, you know, of, of this or an incantation or, you know, shaking the preacher's hand. It's not, it's not achieved because you got water baptized, because you got sprinkled, dunked, soaked. It, none of that. Is, it is the confession. Whosoever shall confess with his mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's what Paul says right here. And shall believe in his heart that God has raised him from the dead shall be saved. And so Paul makes it very clear. And, and Christianity has historically been called the great confession. Because you come into the kingdom by saying what you believe. Okay? See, the confession is, is the belief of the heart that God raised Jesus from the dead what, for your justification. When you study that out, the implication and understanding what Paul's writings, um, uh, when, he said, when, he's, when he said that, there is a reference to his teachings on the resurrection of Christ and that we were raised up with him and made to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ. His reference is in, in, his, in his doctrine is to the other things he wrote, okay, um, or was going to write. But the, these, these, these references are, you know, if you confess that Jesus is Lord and that you believe that he's been raised from the dead, but they, then you go back and he gets more explanatory in Ephesians. You know, he raised us up together. See, what am I, when I confess that he's been raised up, or I believe God raised him from the dead, well, he was, and, and Paul even writes this and says, he was raised for, again for our justification. He was raised for our justification. Okay? So I believe that he, I confess him as my Lord and I believe in my heart that God raised him up for my justification. I'm putting my faith in his redemptive work. I'm putting my faith in what he did for me. Okay? And I decree that. I declare that with my confession. Now, my confession is not just getting baptized. As a matter of fact, um, when we see the book Church um, 
Well, at Ephesus, when, when they ha and pa having passed through the upper coast of, of Ephesus, Paul found these certain disciples there and said, have you received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And they said, uh, no, we know, not, have not much, so much as heard of whether there be any Holy Ghost. And then, you know, he says, well, what baptism were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And then he, he showed them a different way. And then they baptized him in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay? And the Holy Ghost came on them. And another place talks about how that... Um, they were going to they, the candidates for the Holy Spirit and said, seeing that they, they uh, after they were water baptized, I mean, they were, they were baptized. They, they you know, uh, can any man forbid water seeing, you know, okay. And so we, we get, we get into those things where we find out they were born again. Then they were water baptized as an open or public testimony of the inner work that's already taken place because of their faith. Okay. Uh, taking first communion to save you. We have a lot of people in the church believe that communion saves you. A communion is or, or the U, holy Eucharist. I mean, depending on what or, you know, what liturgical or non-liturgical type churches how you refer to it. But the the Eucharist, the holy Eucharist, communion, it's all referencing the same thing: the Lord's table, where Jesus <clears throat> was explaining that this is symbolic of Him. The bread was symbolic of broken body that provided healing for you the juice was symbolic of his shed blood for your redemption and cleansing that we partook of that symbolically it does not literally become the body and the blood of the lord um that that some people refer to, to that doctrine as transmutation which they um just a description um that you know it's it's literally transferred into the literal body of the lord um you know jesus told the disciples that flesh and drink my blood you have with me and they walked away because that they that was so that was the, the real actually doing that was violation of scripture okay it, and it was it was not he wasn't being literal you have to take things allegorically in the bible when you can't take them literally behold the trees of the field with their hands not really it's 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 allegoric we're getting a typology here, okay? When Jesus said, eat thy flesh and drink my blood, he's not talking about them coming out there and, you know, and being the walking dead and, and consuming him, okay? I don't know if you've ever seen that. Like, I'm glad. So, uh, the kids got me hooked on that for a little while. I'm like, I, I, I just quit. I said, I can't take this show anymore. It's, it's too, it's too, it's too something. It's just like, okay, uh, you know. Hallelujah. You know, so that's not what saves us. Okay? Partaking of his, uh, of, of the work of his, his, by his stripes we're healed. Partaking of the work of the shed blood, receiving the work of that blood, we're born again. Don't literally drink his blood. Okay? As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, they were forbidden. See, see when we got types, the, the, the antithesis, or the, you know, the antitype, you know, the in, in this case, the real. You got the type of the shedding of the blood. Remember, they had to cook it thoroughly. They could not eat the blood. When, when you go back and study, uh, the, the type of the lamb being slain and the sacrifice, that blood could not be eaten, drank. They had to cook it until, the, until there was no blood there. <clears throat> Yet, we're, you come over here in the New Testament, people saying we had to eat, drink his blood, basically, you know. But under the old, we were prohibited from the, in the type of doing that. So in the antithesis, we can't. That they, it, it doesn't it doesn't line up, okay? It doesn't line up. So um, <clears throat> it's not a literal. I said it's not a literal, okay? Um, it's it's symbolic that by, by by confessing him as Lord and receiving him as my Lord, you know, the, the blood cleanses us. You know, the body heals us. It's 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 a it's a typology. It's allegorical. It is not literal, okay? Um, and so Paul writes here, and so the great confession is that if we confess him as Lord, we're saved. All right, um, moving down to John 1, 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue. Oh, I love that one. Yeah, people love that one. I, I had to flip Wilson. The devil made me do it, honey. You know, I just can't help myself. Well, you, maybe sugar pie, honey bunch, you can't help yourself. But then when it comes to speaking everything in your mouth, you better help yourself. All right. You know, well, if you bridle not your tongue. That's right. What happens? 
you deceive yourself. I find that interesting. So let's read this verse. James 1, 26. If any man among you seem to be religious, and brideth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. <clears throat> you can't control your mouth. You're, you're, you know, you, you got to bridle your tongue. Your tongue has to be brought under control. Your tongue has to be brought under control. Okay? You got to bridle the tongue. That is not, you know, and of course, James goes on um, in his, his epistle to the church, and he talks about how the tongue is an unruly evil full of poison, and um, you know, he just. Uh, he, he's not a fan of the tongue. <laughs> I mean, just, just be real, be real honest here. He's not a big fan of your tongue, okay? <clears throat> um, because people's, people's tongue gets them in trouble, okay? And um, so, but you know, um, if any man brought up his nice tongue, he's, his religion is in vain. And um, we have, you know, um, where is it? Okay, verse chapter 3 gets into... Um, Verse 1, my brethren, be not ma many masters, knowing that we shall receive the condemnation. For if any, in many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect, that means mature, man, and able to bridle the whole body. Notice he gets over in chapter 3 <laughs> and tells us that if we don't offend in word, what do you mean? what we say we're able to bridle the whole body we can what bridle the whole body think about that james comes starts out and he tells us in chapter one one thing and he comes over here and goes um The man is perfect. Now, that, again, we've talked about this. The word perfect in the, in the New Testament often means mature, not flawless. Okay? It, has, it, it carries a connotation of maturity, not flawlessness. You know, we, we, we use the word perfect, perfect or perfection in many ways. And even today, we, we use it in different meanings, you know? Um, okay? A uh, girl sees a guy. Oh, he's perfect for me. Well, it doesn't mean he is flawless. It means he has all the characteristics I like. Okay? Um, so, here it, it really carries more the, the idea of uh, maturity. We put, behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the great of the ships, which are, though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. So, you know, you got this big ship. I mean, how many of you ever, 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 ever see a big old um, battleship or aircraft carrier aircraft carriers are just they, they just amaze me they, they just i mean i just i can't explain to you how they much they amaze me how big they are i mean that huge landing deck in the cross deck and all the, and then everything underneath and the elevators that bring the, the jets up from below and then all the housing and the in the kitchens and all the stuff for the guys to be in i mean you got a floating city you know, a floating airport with city, you know, a city attached. And um, you get this great big old ship, okay? Now, I'm not going to do a real good job of, of drawing my ship, okay? You know, we got the Coning Tower. You know, that's not real good anyway. You know, that's, that's terrible anyway. And that's the U.S. Da -da -da, something or another, okay? okay? We got the U.S. something or another, all right? And that thing is steered by this rudder. In comparison, it's small. Now, if you go down and look at it, you think, my God, that thing's huge. But in, in relation to that ship, it is tiny. Now, it might be bigger than your house. No, well, it's not that big, but it's, it's big. It can be huge as far as what we, in comparison to us, but in comparison to, you know, three football fields long and, you know, extra, X, X, how many tons of you know, displacement weight and all this stuff, it's nothing. Yet that rudder can turn that entire ship where it wants it to go. And it doesn't do it on the dime. It may take, 
you know, a half mile to a mile to two miles to turn that the direction they want to go. Okay? Because, you know, it turns and it starts. So that, 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 that baby's going this direction and you, you start turning that rudder and it starts slowly turning the back end. Okay? And he says here, Behold the ships, though they be great, are driven of fierce winds. Now, you understand, these were sail ships back in those days, so they had sails up. And the wind's just driving that. Yet they could turn that helm and turn the rudder. And without, even with all that wind driving it, the, the sails were, were designed to shift and still catch the wind. But it, the ship's direction was changed by that rudder. Okay? And wherever the governor or the, the helmsman, okay, we, we would say helmsman or, you know, um, uh, pilot, you know, captain, whoever's at the rudder, I mean, at the helm, whether he lives, whatever he wants. Wherever the, wherever the helmsman wants, when he turns it, that's where it goes. Even so, so now Paul's saying, he's saying, look, here, James is saying, this is a type. And even so, the tongue is a little member. And boasteth great things. And so, um, behold how great a little matter, a, fi a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and selleth, setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and birds and serpents and of things in the sea is tamed, hath been tamed to mankind, but the tongue can no man tame it is under evil ruling of deadly poison. Okay? Therefore, bless we God the Father, and wherewith we curse men, which are made in this absolute of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Doth the fountain send forth to the same place bitter water and sweet? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive trees, either the vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is wise and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good lifestyle his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you are bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but what are you talking about earlier? If you don't bridle your tongue, you deceive yourself. You know, this, you know, if you have um, bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. If you think you're doing cool, yet you're going against Scripture, your heart's deceived. Okay, and you're lying against the truth. It descends not from above, it is earthly, sensual, devilish. Where envying and strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and full of the fruits of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So he spends this whole chapter talking about the tongue. And we find out, he says, no man can tame the tongue. Well, you know, the chapter. Okay, whole chapter. All right, no man can tame the tongue. We do not have the power to simply we're not gonna we're not gonna say that everything because you know, your mouth is going to speak what what did jesus say your mouth would speak out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh so you can't tame the tongue but god's word can If you put enough of God's word in your heart, it'll control what comes out of your mouth. Okay. Last week we talked about how that, you know, we, we can't keep putting the wrong things in a computer and expecting a different result on the other end. We can't keep putting the wrong thing in our heart and ex expecting a different outcome coming out of our mouth, out of our life. It doesn't work that way. Okay. So James talks a lot about the tongue here. So we have to, understand what we put in is imperative because if we want to say the right things we want to get the right things then we've got to watch what's coming out okay we go to second corinthians chapter four uh, look over there with me if you will Paul's second official letter to the church of corner probably his fourth seems on evidence that he wrote four letters we just don't have the other two and you have to say, well, then God must not want us to have them. You know, we believe there is one um, preceded 1 Corinthians and one that uh, preceded 2 Corinthians. 
um, just from some things that are said in the letters, okay? And um, we don't have any proof. We just, it just seems, seems to be internal evidence that may, that may be so, okay? So he writes here in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm trying to see how much I can get out of this. Therefore, verse 1, we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. But we renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth. Now I want to say something here. If Paul was writing ahead and said, we don't handle the word of God deceitfully, there must have been people who were. And I can just add to that, and there are people who are. They're handling it deceitfully. Okay, we we get we get over on this love kick sometimes to the point that we don't do what the Bible tells us to do to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Like ostriches, we stick our head in the sand, and say drop kick me Satan through the goalpost of life. Okay, um, who handle nor do we, nor do we handle the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan blinds people's hearts to keep them from receiving the light. For we preach on ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourself your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul goes on right here and says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Uh, one translation says it this way, knocked down, but not knocked out. I love that one, you know. We've been knocked down, but we're not knocked out. I'm getting back. I'm rocky. Don't throw in the towel. Who will throw in the towel? Cut it, cut it. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. We which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. In other words, you're facing uh testings you're facing trials you're facing persecutions you're facing uh you know uh um, um well persecution we're facing judgment from other people we're facing all kinds of, in some parts of the world they, they kill you for for maintaining your faith in christ okay we don't see that in america but i'm telling you it's it's we're seeing the spirit rise up in america that same spirit's rising up in america okay um so we're always delivering death for Jesus sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in what our mortal body. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. He goes on verse 13. But we are we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written. I believe and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. So then Paul comes and you know we're here in second Corinthians. The fourth chapter was this verse 13 and says what we have something called the spirit of faith what is that well I believed therefore have I spoken So Paul says, the spirit of faith is, I believe, therefore have I spoken. There, uh, missed the four. Okay, four. All right, got it in there. I, sque I squeezed it in there, okay? Somebody always said, you know, and whenever you see the word therefore, look and see what it's there for. Okay? I speak, but I speak because I believed. And then he comes back and he, and he brings it, because and, and, that is an Old Testament scripture, an Old Testament reference. He comes and goes, hey, we also believe and therefore speak. The spirit of faith is speaking what you believe from God. That's what, that's what the spirit of faith is. 
So Paul writes to the church of Corinth and says, you know, uh, we have in the same spirit of faith. There's not two different. There's not a different spirit of faith. The spirit of faith is the spirit of faith. And it works this way. It works with, I believe, therefore have I spoken. And now we also believe and therefore speak. Makes it, makes it present tense. Makes it active in the church today. Makes it real to the church today. You know, can't come along and go, that was for the Jews only. Oh, shut up with your lack of knowledge of the Bible. You know, you know, people are always looking for ways for us not to have something that word God's word promises us. You know, they just want to, you know, because they, they want to be so right that they're, you know, they, they get angry. Oh, they get angry. When Brother Hagin passed away, there were people who hated him so bad. You know, Lordy, Lordy, Kenneth Hagin died. Didn't guess he didn't have enough faith. Man was 87 years old. Supposed to have been dead at 16. Before 16. And he lived, he lived to 87. All right. Get over yourself. You know what I'm talking about? Sheesh. Well, Lordy, Lordy, Kenneth Hagin died. He didn't have enough faith not to die. Let's see how it works out for you, baby. Well, take your, find out who you are and see how long you live. Okay? And let me tell you, when he gets to heaven, Jesus is going to meet him and have a talk with him about it, too. If, he was, if he's Christian, if he's born again. Or he could be just one of them religious, hateful people. Okay? All right. Why, why can we believe things and speak it? Because what do we say over here? And uh, we don't have it up here. <laughs> My terrible ship. Romans. Was Romans ten seventeen say class? So then, what? Faith. What? Come on. What does faith do? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now I got faith. What is what's believing? It is the action, it is the active voice of faith. They come from the same Greek word, pisteo and pistis. Okay? One's verb, one's noun. Faith is the noun. Okay? I don't I faith, therefore I have I spoken. No. I believe. What, 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 what is my believing? It's my faith. Faith is the noun. Okay? Believing or believed or believing the form of a verb. I believe, therefore have I spoken, but I spoke what came by hearing the word of God. I spoke my faith. Okay? Why can we do that? Let's look real quick. This probably might be our last verse. We're going to go to Psalm. I don't have an eraser in here, so I can't even erase. Okay? Psalm 89, 34. All right? I'm going to kind of finish that right here because this is a, this is a pinnacle scripture to everything we've talked about. Give you a second to get there because you need to mark it in your Bible, you need to underline it, you get out your highlighter and, you know, uh, make it so you can find it without even thinking about it. You need to put stars beside it, um, you know, put tabs there, say with little arrows on it, say look at this, look at this. Okay, because you don't need to forget this. <clears throat> you don't need to forget this. Psalm 89, verse 34. My covenant will I not break. Ready for this one? Nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. <clears throat> Once I have sworn by my holiness... That I will not lie unto David. Okay? And God's saying, I will keep covenant with those I've, I've made covenant with. And the thing that I love here is this. Because you get people come along and say, God's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to. He can say the yes, yeah, but he can change his mind. Yeah, he says he will not alter. Alter what? The thing that came out of his mouth. What does that mean? That means he can't lie. He can't tell you he's going to do something and then change it because he's sovereign. 
Because he said, I'll keep my covenant and I won't alter the thing that came, that's gone out of my lips. If I spoke it, I'm going to keep it. He can't come along. He can't come along. God can do anything. He can't come along and change after he said he's not going to change. Because that makes him a liar. In the Bible, Jesus said that Satan is the father of all liars. To lie, for God to lie, subordinates himself to the father of liars. Satan would become his father. Satan would become his authority. God can't lie. You can say all day long, God can do anything he wants to. God can't, God's incapable of violating his own law, his own commands, his own thing that has gone out of his lips. The assurance in this is great because if you come to him, okay, if I come to him, you know, and this is what Paul was dealing with, uh, with the Gnostics, and the, uh, and, well, actually not Gnostics as much as the, the Judaizers. He dealt with the Judaizers. John, John dealt with the Gnostics. Paul dealt with the Judaizers who came and said, okay, y'all believed on Jesus, but that's not enough. You need to be circumcised. And Paul's like, Wait a second. If we return to the law, we've made, the, we've made Christ of none effect. <clears throat> okay? Now, all you out there who try to make this apply to some stuff today so you can preach your crazy grace, just go read your Bible better and read the whole thing and just not your favorite scriptures. Okay? And don't send me no emails and don't post on my Facebook page and don't post on the church's Facebook page. I don't want to hear it because you're wrong. Okay? You're arrogant. I'm right. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm just, I'm just so tired of all the, the people who don't read their Bible and study it and get the right perspective, the whole, and then they go off to say stuff that messes people up. They're running around all best. I can fornicate and drink and shoot up and smoke dope and do anything I want to, and it's okay. God loves me. I'm going to heaven. Woo! You're telling them to violate everything their heart's telling them and the Scripture's telling them. Because you, you want to prove a narrative give you a flying raspberry there you go yes i just did that on the internet all over the world and i still love you because i'll tell you the truth okay the great thing is because we know god won't alter that when i go to his word and i find something that that applies to an aspect of my life and i need that i don't have to wonder well well i don't know but but did he really mean that for for me he's going to change his mind because and the devil will tell you god changed his mind god doesn't do that anymore god this god god said i won't alter it i won't alter the thing that's going out of my lips okay god keeps his word god is faithful to his word amen okay and so we need to be understanding we need to see and this is so important because if we're going to have our words our tongue our future effectively working for us and that we that we're getting faith that's coming by hearing hearing by the word of god and we are going to have the spirit of faith that believes and therefore speaks and have it there's so much word in us that tames our tongue we see, we see what god says about things <clears throat> okay now we're bridling our whole body we're governing our whole life by the words we speak our tongue being controlled by being full of god's word and that what governs and controls our future Hallelujah. We set the future motion according to what God says. And we eat the fruit thereof. The power of life and death is in the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Proverbs. Amen. Praise the Lord. We sure hope you've enjoyed this series over the past oh, two months. And I hope that you've gotten some things out of it that will help you. And if I made you mad because I told you that some of your crazy stuff was wrong. Um, love me anyway. Be as tall. You know, forgiving as you say that that you are, <laughs> and that, that God is, and and uh, you know, just just take it for what it is and go check it out for yourself. Don't listen to your favorite preacher all the time. Go see what the Bible says. All right, praise the Lord. Well, you people just love follow Brother Hagin. Brother Hagin would tell us, don't you go out and tell anybody I said such and such. He said the Bible said. It? Well, yeah, the Bible said it. Then you say the Bible said it. Don't you tell him I said it? Because if it's, if you tell him I said it, it don't mean anything. Find out for yourself that it's in the Word of God. Find out for yourself that what God believes, what God says. 
Prove it out yourself and go live it. Don't go telling people that I said it. That don't do you any good. But I'm saying the same thing. Don't, don't say that some preacher says, well, I don't care if they've got nice television screens, bed heads, skinny jeans, and never use their Bible. You know? Because they, they tell funny stories and you just love the way they perform on, on the platform. This is not a performance. This isn't about can you perform. This is about um, giving direction by the Holy Ghost with the Word of God that will change your life. And not about whether or not, you know, I'm going to be, you know, I'm marketable. And we, we've paid the price for that in the music industry. We've got music out today where the people can't sing. They must be auto-tuned. They must be overridden with a bunch of music because they can dance or they got the right face for a music video. And they're a horrible musician or, or singer. Technically, they don't measure up anywhere. But because they're marketable, you know, they have the right look. You know, they, they fix all the other stuff. You know, they go in and they fix it all with, with auto-tuning and all this stuff. They change their pitch and everything. You know, and, um, and it's not really, in the end, it's not even them. It's fake. Okay? We're not looking for marketable preachers. We're looking for the Word of God to change your life. We want the Word of God to change your life. All right, praise God. We love you. God bless you. Until we meet again, remember this, that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. See you on Sunday morning at 1030 right here at Faith and Victory Church. Yeah.